Hello. All right, now, vectors out of the way. Um, let's actually get into some good physics content. Uh, and we'll start with Newton's laws. Newton's laws of motion provide a mathematical way of describing the physical world around us. They provide a highly, highly accurate way of viewing the world. Uh, as he wrote them down um, in his Principia, that he was first published, I guess, in 1687. He came up with three laws of motion that together fundamentally altered how we perceive the world. Now, while Galileo and Descartes had written down versions of some of these laws, you know, so you might ask whether these are actually Newton's laws, uh, nonetheless, no one was able to state them as precisely as Newton was able to, and as well as Newton was able to see that these three laws together are really what matter. Um, this happens more often than you think. You know, Maxwell's equations in electromagnetism is the same sort of thing. Maxwell didn't come up with a single one of them. He added one term to one of those four equations. That was his kind of scientific contribution in terms of the mathematics of those equations. But he was the one that realized that when you use them all together, a, a un unification of electricity and magnetism took place. So Newton's three laws, as he wrote them on the screen, and remember, English was different back in the day. Uh, for these sounds kind of arcane and uh, antiquated. You might recognize as his first law being the law of inertia. Everybody preserves in its state of rest or in uniform motion in a right line unless it's compelled to change by that, that state by forces. I can't even read it. It's so weird. Uh, state by forces impressed thereon. The alteration of motion is proportional to the motive force impressed, and it is in the direction of the right line which that force is impressed. We now write that as F equals MA. And the third law, to every action there is a, always opposed an equal reaction, uh, or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed in opposite directions or contrary parts. And again, this is an upheaval um, of a lot of deeply rooted ideas that started with people like Aristotle almost 20 centuries prior. Uh, and as you know from solving Newton's laws in introductory physics, some of the implications of these only become clear after a great deal of effort, because our intuition, which is based on everyday experiences, typically leads us astray. Uh, it's not until we heavily scrutinize our observations that we can come to Newton's laws compared to, say, the ones that Aristotle had came up with 20 centuries ago. Aristotle had frozen this notion of the way the way world worked by making logical arguments and simple observations where he concluded that the natural state of things is to be at rest. Wait long enough and things stop. I push an object across a table, it eventually will slide to rest as a result. Um, it seems that no matter what you do, wait long enough, things eventually come to rest. So he argued then that this thing we might call a force, a force is required to just to keep things moving, even at a constant speed. If I want to move at a constant speed, I have to continuously apply a force to the object to get it to keep moving. Else, if I stop applying a force, it will come to rest. And while we now know that is wrong, Again, we cannot blame him because you definitely had this model of how the universe worked before taking physics. And even as physics majors, or even you know, as someone who understands physics, this mindset would immediately enter your mind in cases because it kind of jives more with everyday experiences. If you're being chased by a lion, I think most of you would not say that you just need to give a really strong push at the start and you'll just coast away at a constant speed from that lion you'd be eaten immediately. Right? Rather, you would think that you need to continuously be putting in an effort to run so that you can outrun the lion. Though that contradicts the idea of what is stated in Newton's first two laws of motion. Of course, it's friction that is, is, that is the issue there, and that there is frictional forces that are slowing you down, that's slowing the apple down as it's pushed across the table. So it's not that in the absence of force, so, right, 
while Aristotle might have thought that by removing my hand, I am removing all forces, there were, there were other forces involved. Uh, subtle effects like air resistance and friction uh, can be pesky things uh, and was unclear to people for, for a long time. We also can't really, bl we can't blame Aristotle. Most of what Aristotle you know, came up with has turned out to be wrong, uh, but we don't call him a dummy because he was doing science, you know, with a limited, simple, you know, in hindsight, observations uh, that he had, you know, compared to what we can do today. Um, plus, back in the day, the idea of doing experiments wasn't really a thing. Uh, it was more that Aristotle had observations and he reached kind of logical conclusions based on those observations. He didn't really do experiments. That idea, you know, that's now deeply rooted in the scientific method took centuries, you know, to, you know, after Aristotle, um, Francis Bacon and others uh, to, to come up with, or Al, Al Hathiam and, uh, you know, is another one that had early ideas of what we now call the modern scientific method. So if we're to lob criticism really at Aristotle in any way, maybe it's that he didn't make enough careful observations that he then abstracted. Maybe if he had seen cases like trying to push the same apple across a table and across ice, he might have noticed that there's a difference there uh, and reached something that's more akin to Newton's first laws of motion. But again, that's okay. Science is allowed to change uh, based on new data and observations. Plus, what makes Newton's laws kind of challenging to uh, at least come up with just based on abstraction of, sim of, of simple experiments is that, particularly in the case of friction, it's really hard to eliminate friction entirely in most cases. So no matter what experiment you do, right, there's always perhaps things like air resistance and friction that are might subtly be impacting your results. Um, so to come up with Newton's laws as they are, right, also requires kind of a level of abstraction that's required um, to come up with Newton's laws. Uh, and Galileo and Descartes, uh, before Newton, had started this kind of thinking, uh, particularly with Newton's first law, Newton's law of inertia. Uh, you know, Descartes had said, and had done this purely by thought, uh, that he believed in this idea of inertia, that once an object is moving, it just wants to keep moving, and it will continue moving unless something imposes it and causes it to stop. Which is, in essence, Newton's first law. Galileo did experiments on this where he imagined, he essentially did the thing I said earlier, where he had objects that he could slide across the surface and they would come to rest. They would always come to rest, like Aristotle thinks, you know, everything should. But then he imagined if he were to take that same object and slide it across surfaces that are slipperier and slipperier. He could observe that that same object would go farther before coming to rest, and the slipperier the surface got, the farther it went before eventually coming to rest. So he abstracted and reasoned that if he could eliminate any sort of stickiness, or what we now say is friction, on the surface, that the object would come, would, would slide at a constant speed in a linear direction. Um, so he had essentially come up with the idea of Newton's first law uh, that then Newton encoded. He also came very close to coming up with Newton's second law as well in his studies of falling objects and rolling objects down inclines. Uh, he had come up with you know, ideas that were getting very close to this idea of forces equal, force equals the mass times acceleration. Uh, particularly his famous experiments, you know, you know, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, that's likely apocryphal. Uh, it's probably unlikely that he actually dropped things from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Actually, I did read once that there was, there some historians believe that actually it wasn't Galileo that did that, but there were actually other scientists that were more in support of Aristotle, that they, they wanted to disprove Galileo by doing these experiments and showing that if they take, say, a ball and a feather and drop it down, that they would hit the ground at different rates, or they would accelerate at different rates. Um, in that case, it would, but again, the feather is experiencing friction as a result. You know, Galileo took things where he took very similar shaped objects that were clearly different weights, you know, a denser ball and a lighter ball. They were the same size, but different, different weights, and dropped them, and very carefully realized that no matter what the mass or the weight of the object is, they always hit the ground at the same time if they were released from rest from the same spot. And we've done this on the moon, uh, where astronauts have dropped a hammer and a feather 
and they have hit the ground at the same time because there the there's essentially very little atmosphere there's no friction to deal with so the feather can fall uh, you know based entirely on gravity and not have to deal with friction you can do this also with a piece of paper right take you know I do this usually in, in a as a class demo right take something like an apple and then take a sheet of paper clearly the sheet of paper has less mass than the apple drop them the sheet of course will take longer to get to the bottom to the floor compared to the apple but then take the same piece of paper and crinkle it up into a tiny tiny ball so you're not changing the amount of paper uh, but you now turn it into a little tight compact ball and then when you drop them they hit the ground at the same time so again that suggests that it's not the mass or the weight of the object but it's something else that caused the feather or the piece of paper to take longer to get to the bottom and then Newton's third law actually was the one that was not proven but inferred and this one I mean you can try to argue it via say symmetry and you come up with thought experiments that suggest that there is a symmetry to when two objects interact there's an equal and opposite force um, acting on the objects you know I think one thought experiment is something like take two electrons and and believe me when I say that they are two identical electrons and I set them up at rest and let go now we know that then they would repel each other and they would both move in opposite directions but you can imagine that say I take two electrons two identical electrons release them from rest and only one of them moves from uh, being repelled then I ask you to close your eyes and I reset the experiment up and then you open your eyes and the same two electrons are back in their initial spots and I let go again you of course would expect if this were the one to move you would expect that it again would move uh, in the opposite direction but since I asked you to close your eyes I could say it's possible I could have switched the two electrons and you know, where they would have started and even if you you know whether or not you know I switched them you would still would expect since from your observation it's an identical experiment the one over here should then be repelled in that direction so whether I switch them or not it suggests that both electrons have to be able to feel something by the symmetry of the situation so the natural conclusion is that they both feel force that's equal and opposite uh, you know in opposite directions all right so let's delve into just the definition of Newton's laws of motion as they're written on the screen you know it's a little antiquated this is typically not how we see them in textbooks you know, typically how we might see them in textbooks is something like this right in the absence of forces a particle moves with a constant velocity v for any particle of mass m the net force on the particle changes the momentum of the particle uh, where momentum can be defined as m times v when the mass is constant the net force is equal to the mass times the particle's acceleration f equals ma then the third law if object one exerts a force f2 one on object two so force a uh, force on two from one then object two exerts a reaction force f12 force on one from two on the object that is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction great however there are issues I have with the way that these laws are written uh, the kind of classic textbook way of writing down these laws here's some issues I have or questions I had as as when I was an undergrad thinking about these things for one it doesn't really ever define what a force is what is a force uh, we just kind of made it this entity where do they arise from how can you define a quote-unquote force and something that really perplexed me for a long time as a kid is that Newton's first law seemed like just a example of Newton's second law if I have F equals ma and there are no forces on the object then F net is zero that suggests that the acceleration is zero but if the acceleration is zero and I know that acceleration is how velocities change that implies that the velocity better be a constant vector which is looks like Newton's first law so so that reading is kind of it seems like there's some redundancy there so what is the first law saying that's different or unique compared to the second law an issue with the third law is that um, the way that's usually written 
action and reaction, to me, there's causality there. Um, it's that one thing has to happen first, and then as a result, the other happens. I push on the box, and therefore, only after the box then pushes on me. Where really, it's a simultaneous thing. By touching the box, the box touches me simultaneously. There are these forces, equal and opposite in direction. You can also ask, when are these things valid? When can I use Newton's laws of motion? Particularly since we now know, we can easily find examples in quantum mechanics, relativity, electromagnetism, where these don't always work. So let's see if we can upgrade a little bit our understanding of Newton's laws of motion. Um, particularly, let's focus on the idea of, for this module, of just trying to define force. And I think my reading of these laws is that I can actually use the third law of motion as a way to define forces. What is a force? Typically, you read it as kind of forces or pushes or pulls, right? That's kind of a simple way of, just, of, of describing it. And I like that. That's not a bad definition. A push or a pull. Pushes or pulls have directionality. So to me, that suggests this force thing, whatever it is, is a vector. So forces are going to be vectors if they're pushes or pulls. But the third law is where it defines kind of where forces arise from. They only occur, forces only exist when two objects interact with one another. No force completely exists completely independent of, a, of another force. If so, there has to be some sort of interaction between two objects, in which case two forces arise. You never just get one force arises. When two objects interact, there's always two forces that, that arise, and they arise as the result of interactions. They are the result of two objects interacting with, with one another by touching. Now, there, are, there is an exception to this. Uh, the long-range forces of, say, gravity and electromagnetism, where they, objects don't actually need to be touching uh, for these forces to for forces to be exerted on an object, but nonetheless, those forces. Gra let's just stick with gravity for this class. Uh, if gra if the Earth's gravity pulls on the box, there nonetheless is the box pulling on the Earth via gravity as well. There is still a pair of forces, but in that case, they don't necessarily require the two objects to be touching one another. The vast, vast, vast majority of forces arise because of a contact interaction. But generally, you can say that forces are all about interactions. So I might, if I may, write down Newton's three laws more like this. And we're only going to focus on the third one today. How I might interpret them by the third law, reading that one first, is that a force is one side of an interaction between two objects in contact. There must be touching, the exception being the long-range forces, which in this class is probably just going to be gravity. There are always two forces to every interaction, the force of object one on object two and the force of object two on object one, which are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Each of those forces act only on one object in, in the interaction. If an interaction suggests there are two objects interacting with one another, and therefore there is that interaction, two forces arise. But each of those forces are acting on a different object at the point of contact. Right? Force of object one on object two, and the force of object two on object one. Each of these gets one force vector that is acting on it. Uh, that arise from this interaction. Let me see if I can write down what I mean by this and what this implies about the origin of forces. Well, actually, the first, let me read the others. The first law we'll see in the next module is that actually Newton, the first law is saying something about when Newton's second law is valid. We'll talk that the first law is saying something that Newton's second law is valid only in this thing called an inertial reference frame, and Newton's first law actually gives you a way of testing whether or not you're in an inertial reference frame, and you can apply Newton's second law. 
And then Newton's second law is more or less unchanged. The net force on an object changes its momentum. And in the case where the mass is a constant, you get F net equals MA. Uh, but there, I think there is a little bit more causality. So I like it to write instead is that the result of forces acting on an object with mass M is that the object experiences as a result an acceleration A, which is the net force divided by its mass. But for this third law, again, trying to define the idea of forces. We have some implications that we've already talked about um, of Newton's third law. All right, we've talked about that forces are vectors. And they arise as pairs in an interaction. And pairs were the highlight. There is always two, always two forces arise in the interaction. They're occurring at the point of contact between the two objects, the exception being the long range forces like gravity. And something I haven't really said yet is that these force pairs are always of the same type. So let's do a simple example here of what I mean. Let's suppose there's a box sitting on a table, or let's just have it sitting on the ground. And then I push on the box and I want to identify all the forces just overall, right? This is a universe where it's the earth, the box, and my hand. Uh, can I identify all the forces uh, in this cosmos? Well, one way to identify where do forces arise, they arise at points of contact. So there is a part of the box where my hand is touching the box. At that point where the box and the hand are in contact, two forces appear. There is a force pointing in this direction, which I will say it's the force on box from hand that's pushing the box to the right. That is one side of the interaction. My hand touches the box. My hand and the box are interacting. There's an interaction force of force on, you know, um, on box from hand. There then arises an equal and opposite force pointing in the opposite direction of force on hand from box. These are kind of unwieldy subscripts, but they help make it super, super clear what are the Newton third law pairs. The hand and the box touch each other, force of on box from hand and on hand from box. Those are the Newton third law pairs. If I were to write them down mathematically, they would be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Those two forces, Okay. The box is also touching the ground. It is touching the ground and there is a point of contact here where the ground and the box are in contact. Therefore, two forces arise. 
there is a force on ground from box and that's acting on the ground and then there is a force on box from ground. You might say, well, what about the normal force? Stop, right? People, I hate the fact that the normal force gets its own name uh, because it's not its own magical force, right? The normal force, as it's typically taught in introductory sequences, is really just what I wrote down as force on box from ground. It is the force of the ground pushing up on the box. But this makes it more clear that it's arising because there's a contact between the box and the ground. Oh, well, isn't the normal force equal to m times g? Stop. There you're incorrectly trying to connect gravitational forces and contact forces, which are different types. One's gravity, a long-range force. One's a contact force. Sometimes they are equal in magnitude, but they are not by default connected to one another. So please do not immediately write down that normal forces are equal to mg. Uh, also, if you can get, if you can help it, maybe stop saying normal force at all. Uh, I particularly don't like it. I think it's misleading. But so far we've identified four forces total. Two of them are acting on the box force on box from hand and on box from ground. Then there's one force acting on the hand, on hand from box, and there's one force acting on the ground, on ground from box. Then the last thing, once, and notice that at that point, I've identified everything that's touching the box. There's nothing else touching the box. The hand is touching the box, and the ground is touching the, is touching the box. Each of those interactions created two forces, notice. Now that I've identified everything that's, and then the hand and the ground don't seem to be touching one another, so I don't have to worry about an interaction pair between them. Once you're done with all the actual touching, then you can ask yourself, do I have any long range forces I need to worry about? In this case, let's include the gravitational pull of the Earth on the on the box, and therefore the box must also pull gravitationally on uh, the Earth as well. You might say, well, didn't we just write that down you know, in some of the other ones? No, because the, the reds and the greens were contact forces resulted from touching. Now we can then add in, maybe there's, usually I write these arrows not actually on the, on the object, right? I can have force on box from Earth, then I might put a little comma G or something to specify that it's gravity. That's... But then, Newton's third law, I then have to write down a force of on Earth from box, which must be gravitational in nature as well. Force pairs are always of the same type in this case. And then if I wanted to, I technically I could also include the forces of gravity on my hand as well. Um, right, there would be a force on hand from Earth, gravitational, and force on Earth, or yes, on Earth from hand, gravitational, if I wanted to think about that as well. But if I'm just focusing on, say, the box, uh, notice now in this case, I've identified all the possible forces uh, that could potentially be acting on the box. If I draw it like this, uh, where I have the Earth, right, the box, the hand that's pushing on the box. Right, the forces on the box looks like it's there's a force like this uh, of hand on box. We wrote down that there was a gravitational force. Uh, I guess I'll just write it as box from Earth, gravitational. We also said that there was a contact force, F, box from ground. Uh, and we have now identified the three forces that are acting on the box. And then if we were to draw everything else out, there's also this force 
you know, force of box on hand. There's also the contact force, uh, force uh, on ground, which is kind of the same as the earth in this case, uh, from box. And then gravitationally, there is also um, I guess I should have wrote that not inside the Earth, but then there's also force on Earth from box gravitationally. And notice if I count one, two, three, four, five, six, there must always be an even number of forces in the entire problem. There's not an even number of forces acting on the box. There's three forces acting on the box, uh, but each of those forces has a Newton third law pair. Uh, that act on different objects. Again, remember Newton's third law, the forces act, on, the, the pairs act on different objects. You can't have an equal and opposite reaction, you know, pair of forces uh, acting on the same object. It's that they act on different objects, the two objects that are involved in the interaction that's going on. Um, all at points of contact, with the exception for this class being gravity, the long range force. Um, you might also say, uh, we haven't really talked about gravity, but I guess there's another pair I didn't write down, which could be maybe the gravitational force of the box from the from the hand, right? They gravitationally attract each other as well. But again, a, just a pair of forces would rise as a result, um, one on the box and one on the hand, and there would be two gravitational forces that are equal and opposite in direction. So Newton's third law to me is what defines the origin of how forces arise and how you can write them down. And if you take this approach by what is the thing touching, pairs of forces arise, and then add in gravity. That will allow you to more correctly identify all the forces that are acting on a particular object that you're studying. Maybe it's just the box. But again, you got to get it rooted in your mind that it requires, except gravity, points of contact. You know, if I have two boxes and they're attached to a rope and I throw the rope over a support beam on the ceiling and the two boxes are just hanging there, it would be incorrect to say that the support beam is exerting any sort of force on the box is. Because the boxes are not touching the support beam at all. The boxes are touching, if anything, the rope. It's the rope that's exerting forces on the box or each, each of the boxes. The support beam, if it's not touching the box, it cannot exert a force on the box. The support beam is touching the rope. So if there, there is a pair of forces, but it's on beam from rope and on rope from beam, uh, that those are the pair of forces. I cannot, it would be incorrect for me to say anything about the beam acting on the box if they're not touching in that case. All right. We will work through this uh, with the first and second law and start doing examples of writing this down, uh, but you can try some simple examples now with the problems.